Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I um, may have just gotten a quick pop up um, asking if you want to connect to the teleconference. You don't need to do that. All the audio should be coming out of your computer speakers. If I can get a quick check just to see um, if everybody is hearing me, um, in the bottom right corner there is a chat box. And so if you could chat, let us know um, in the chat box that you can hear us. That would be wonderful so we can move forward. Got a couple people hearing me. Perfect. Just want to ensure that everybody can hear. Awesome. So welcome. We're very excited. Um, I'm assuming some people will roll in as we keep going. Um, so we'll welcome them as we go along. My name is Lana Peterson. I'm a professional domestic Professional Development Manager the here at National Women Women in Council. And men of Rotary um, and today we're going to be talking extraordinary about things. They've taught people to read, you know, work toward the world place. I also want to introduce uh, my tech support team, Martin Penny, um, who will be our producer. And if you have any issues so um, with if technical um, pieces, please message him straight through the chat box, and, and he will get set up. Dot org. He is here and um, waiting for any questions that you have. I'm going to ask that everybody introduce themselves to the chat box, that, uh, your name, your location, and your role, and what questions you currently have about Um, I'll kind of introduce people as it comes through. I just want to let everybody know that I only consider myself a facilitator today, and I know we have a lot of um, experience on the webinar, and I want to make sure that not only are you asking questions, but you're answering your peers' questions as well. So if you see something that comes through the chat box and you have an answer as well, um, please send it through and so we can all learn from each other. going to get moving quickly, so I'm going to go through, I see Erin and Kelsey uh, from Youth Concepts, Kim from Green Up County Education, uh, Special Olympics, uh, Wendy After Miller, more than two billion children, is it Milena members are close to wiping polio from Serbia, from wow, Earth. thank you for Thanks joining us, uh, Leslie, Foundation. Adam, Erin, Illinois, twice as hard Ryan, to protect children against bildpolio.org. End polio awesome. now. We'll Visit rotary.org slash end polio. Keep it coming through the chat box and we'll welcome people as you introduce yourselves. I'm going to start the agenda as we wait for more people to introduce themselves to the chat box. Um, so today we're going to talk about what are 21st century skills exactly. Um, that term is used a lot. Um, and how do students achieve those outcomes? Um, we'll talk about service learning as one of those methods for achieving those outcomes. And then what does service learning for 21st century skills really look like in practice? Um, Laura, just to answer, you don't need to be on the phone as well. As long as you can hear it through your computer speakers, you should be fine. Okay? We're just changing one thing. Awesome. Let's see, we have Maris Graves. Awesome. From D.C. We have a group out in D.C. right now for our conference kickoff. So I'm going to get started here, and as more people introduce themselves, um, through that same chat box, I want you to answer the question, what does, that, what does 21st century skills mean to you? When someone uses that term, what comes to mind right away? So share your reflections through the chat box. So Ryan has a question, too, that will answer, what are some of the major challenges in approaching service learning for adolescents? So what does 21st century skills mean to you? So Adam says 21st century skills are skills that get you a job in the 21st century. And just to make sure we didn't have it enabled at first, but make sure it says send to all attendees so everybody can hear you, everybody can see your response that you're sending through. So right underneath um, where you're seeing the chat box, send to and make sure it's 
all attendees are selected. Ryan says 21st century skills is what is needed today in the workplace and what is transferable. And we can get more people to share what 21st century skills means to them or what comes to mind initially when you hear that term being used. Leslie says skills that allow folks to compete in a global economy. Kim says skills that students need in order to succeed in today's fast-paced job market. So I'm going to go over um, kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about 21st century skills, because I often think that it's a term um, that's used a lot, but without greater, greater clarification or example. Um, today's hope for the webinar is not to assume that um, this is a simple subject to build 21st century learners, but it's actually quite complex. Um, many different factors that play into the process, including the student's background and access, and the fact that we cannot see into the future, so nobody is completely clear on what we, exactly we are preparing them for, um, play into when we're building those 21st century um, learners. Marcus says developing the new workforce. And Jessica has a question. Um, Jessica, you should be able to, you should be hearing it through your computer speakers. So anybody else who isn't, uh, she probably can't hear me, so I'll type that in. I'll have Marcus type that um, to Jessica. Any other ideas for what 21st century skills mean to you? I'm going to move on to the partnership. So I can't even possibly begin to have this webinar um, without calling upon the work that the Partnership for 21st Century Skills has put together. Um, P21.org, and Marcus will send that to the chat box as well. Um, they've created this dynamic framework, um, which will really help you understand what 21st century skills are. Um, and so I really want to thank them again for all the work that they've done. But to give some background, the Partnership for the 21st Century Skills, or P21 as I'll call it, throughout the webinar, was founded in 2002. It was a coalition brought together um, from the business community, the education leaders, and policymakers to position 21st century readiness at the center of U.S. K-12 education and to kickstart a national conversation on the importance of 21st century skills for all students. Um, so on the, on the screen there, you see the framework. They have an awesome website with tons of resources. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about what 21st century skills are. This is the framework that you've created. I, I often refer, this, refer to this as the rainbow. So this is kind of their definition of what 21st century skills are. And they've broken them into four categories. And this is something to remember because we might have a little contest later where there is a fun prize. The first is life and career skills. Um, the second, the yellow in the middle, is learning and innovation skills. So the four C's, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And then in the purple layer, you see information, media, and technology skills. And then underneath in the green um, is our core subjects. And then 21st century themes, which we'll go in a little bit further later. And then underneath, you see kind of the reflection of that rainbow. Um, and that's what they really call the support systems, so standard and assessments, curriculum and instruction, professional development, and learning environments. So that's really how teachers can develop those skills for themselves in order to uh, create 21st century learners within their classroom as well. So if you haven't checked out their website yet, um, please do so. Uh, we will be using um, different resources from their website as well today within our learning, but I want to thank them again for the work that they've done. At the National Youth Leadership Council, um, we are focused on service learning. Of course, we develop young leaders, we support educators, and we advance the field of service learning. Um, and so, of course, we're going to say that service learning is one really great way to create a 21st century learner. And um, we helped create the K-12 service learning standards for quality practice, which are an international internationally adapted set of methodology standards, meaning when service learning is done well, it incorporates these elements. So like I said before, we at NYLC really believe that service learning is a great method for achieving those 21st century skills. 
um, but really thinking about the 21st century skills as the outcome, so that's the final destination, and service learning being one of many powerful ways, or the train, or the airplane, or whatever, however you want to think about it, to reach those outcomes or to reach that destination. But my question to you all, and I'm assuming that you all are kind of on my wavelength, why would service learning be a great method to achieve 21st century skills? I'm going to ask you to answer this question from your own perspective in the chat box. Make sure that you send to all attendees. A lot of you are sending just to me, and I'd be happy to read those out loud, but I'd love for everybody else to read what you're typing as well. So I encourage you all to type in the chat box why you believe service learning is a great methodology for reaching 21st century skills. We'll wait for a few to come through here. Communicate top menu. What's the menu bar? He says, look, to hear the presenter select communicate from the top menu. Why do you think service learning? Let's see, Jesse, thank you for being the first one. Um, gives them an opportunity to use critical thinking skills and collaborate with others as well as identify their own abilities. Laura says, demonstrates how students can use 21st century skills in real life, practical situations. Through service, youth gain understanding of others and the world around them, which allows them to build communication skills that can span the world. Ooh, I like that. Anyone else have a reason why they think service learning would be a great strategy to create 21st century learners? I'm going to share a little bit um, what I have put together as well. You can keep the ideas coming through. Um, just to point out, to start off with life and career skills, um, service learning allows students to apply their learning to the real world, of course, developing those skills and the knowledge that will support them in their future careers. Moving over to learning and innovation skills, you know, service learning is really a project-based model, so students must think critical at solving genuine community needs as well as develop and use communication skills when working with a community partner or advocating for a specific issue. To go all the way over to the purple, information, media, and technology skills are integral for research and painting an accurate picture of the issue. Technology, of course, allows and fast with great benefit to the community. And then at the bottom is the core subjects. Um, and core subjects and content, of course, of course, is essential. In addition to the core content areas, the Partnership for 21st Century Learning has also identified five 21st century interdisciplinary themes. The first is global awareness. The second is financial, economic, business, and entrepreneurial literacy. The third is civic literacy. The fourth is health literacy. And the fifth is environmental literacy. And I really don't think anyone's going to argue with me when I say that those themes really make up the focus of the majority of service learning projects we see today. And the reason for that is because those issues are affecting our world most. Um, let's see, I see. We have a few more in here of why service learning. Let's see, Sula, I believe service learning is a great way to reach 21st century skills because it lets you explore different opportunities and skills and gain the experience to work with their communities. Just want to point out that Sula is also a youth participant on today's webinar. Welcome, Sula. In my community education program, service learning is used to get students to interact more with their community. Students learn more about the needs of the community and ways to meet those needs. That is perfect. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this framework or the use of service learning within it? We'll explore more about examples, but any questions specifically about this framework? We're happy to answer them as we go along as well. So I'm going to move on to some specific strategies for success. Um, and I'm going to share a document with you. Marcus is also going to send the link um, for this document straight through the chat box. Um, 
but the P21 partnership put together an awesome um, implementation guide. And I would suggest um, all of you take a look at it when you're trying to integrate uh, 21st century skills. I'm gonna just quickly go through the pages um, in these guiding recommendations. Um, when you're integrating 21st century skills within your own classroom or program. Um, and so use this document that would be coming through your chat box um, as a resource as well. Um, but I basically took some of the strategies from that document that I think specifically um, apply to service learning and um, talk about how they really work together and how to use these strategies within the program. Um, and so the first strategy that they named is to use a backwards planning model, which is perfect because that is what NYLC has been training on for the past three years. Um, and so it really aligns together um, well. And I'm going to go over the backwards planning model that was adapted from Understanding by Design. Um, but in general, you would start this process by identifying desired results. So the content, skills, and beliefs you want your students to master as a part of this project. So that's where you begin. Oftentimes, these are tied loosely at the end, but we're actually going to begin with those. And some place to find um, standards or assessments or outcomes could be the Common Core Standards, um, the new Civic Education Standards, um, the International Society for Technology and Education has the NET Standards, the National Education Technology Standards. We have Character Education Partnership, the National Science Teacher Association, um, all of these um, links within there you could see. And if there's any other places that you go um, to find standards or outcomes for your students or youth that you participate with, please send it through the chat box. We'll create a library of places. Your curriculum that you use for your program may already have those outcomes aligned as well. And so maybe you're not searching for them or maybe you're not held accountable, but making sure that you start with those goals. Um, and also knowing that you'll need to unpack those goals and outcomes into some skills and background knowledge that students will need to know in order to succeed. So once you know exactly what you want your students to know by the end of this unit or project, then you're going to determine your acceptable evidence. And that's really your summative and formative assessment. So how are your students going to improve? Um, how are they going to prove that they have achieved those goals? And how are you going to measure that progress? Um, and this is where the partnership has a lot of suggestions. Um, the first is that that summative assessment includes higher order thinking, um, such as critical thinking, which aligns well with um, the service learning standard reflection. And we've always encouraged that the reflection really needs to be cognitively challenging. Um, so just summarizing an activity is not nearly enough, um, but really to get them to dissect what happens. Um, and then the real world task. So um, they want that assessment to be connected to real world tasks um, and also building portfolio. And we would encourage you to use genuine community uh, needs as a way to relate your unit to the real world. Next, um, the partnership encourages the use of strong rubrics that are performance-based in order to assess skills. And we would echo that sentiment and add that a strong rubric can lead to stronger youth voice and choice because if a student understands exactly how they will be assessed and what they're going to be held accountable for but can choose how to prove that learning and development to you, they're going to take more ownership over the project. The next stage within um, this planning model is to plan your learning activities. So you're going to take all the outcomes that you want them to have and how you're going to have them prove that to you, and you're going to build your activities in order to guide your students to success within mastery of those outcomes. And so for this, we really use our IPARD model. Um, so this is the IPARD framework, investigation, planning, and preparing, action, reflection, and demonstration. And so just to kind of go through this really quickly, um, you know, the first part, the investigation, that may include community surveys or finding out more particular information around an issue, a lot of research, which is where a lot of the um, media studies can come in as well. The next stage for planning and preparing, um, that really happens through collaboration with peers and partners, which hits on the four C's of the 21st century learning. Um, and really using that initial research to develop a solid plan within the action, and they may be using collaboration documents um, on the internet and technology to work together in order to do that. And oops, 
Um, and then the action. When students execute that action, it may include direct service that has them on site face to face, and that may include tutoring, building trails, or building literacy kits. Um, the service could be indirect where students are using their technology skills to get others involved in the service, such as a drive of some sort or a planning of a fundraiser. Um, or the service could include advocacy-based um, activities where students are using their voices or writing to call attention to a specific issue. Um, from there, they participate in a cognitively challenging reflection that really bridges their experience with their learning, and that could be a part of your final assessment of how they know this information. And then lastly, they're going to demonstrate their learning by flexing their new skills and knowledge um, and then beginning that IPART cycle again. And so um, this is kind of the cycle of student activities and services that you can see uh, within this framework um, that you could really, really integrate a lot of 21st century skills. Does anybody have any questions about this four-step model? I'll go on to the last. Um, if you do start sending them through now, the last step is the self-assessment, um, which NYLC believes that reflection is not just for students, but powerful for educators to increase the quality of their practice. The P21 um, article e echoes that sentiment by encouraging an aligned system through school culture, mission and vision, accountability, professional learning community, and curriculum all focused on 21st century learning. So if everything is aligned, if everybody in the school is focused on the outcome um, for 21st century, we'll see stronger outcomes within students. If there's any questions on this four-part system, please send them through. Now, as I said before, pop quiz. What are the four categories of 21st century skills outcomes outlined in that framework, so the rainbow, created by the Partnership for 21st Century Skills? Type your whole answer through the chat box once you know and um, I'll give a Starbucks gift card to the first three that are able to answer the question right. And while we're waiting for your answers, Christine um, asked, are there any standards for college age students? Oop. Hello? Let's see. Wendy had, looks like Wendy has them down. Jesse and Kim. Nice job. Wendy, Jesse, and Kim. I'm going to have you and Maribel. I'll give a fourth one up. I'm going to have you email me your contact information. Um, Marcus is writing your name down right now. And I will have those Starbucks gift cards out in the mail for you by the end of the day. So thank you for participating in our quick pop quiz. So now we're going to go into some examples of um, 21st century learning through service learning, um, 21st century skill building. Um, so I'm very excited for this because we have some dynamic examples. There's another document that I want to introduce you that, to that was created by um, the P21 group as well. And this may be helpful for those who need to use the Common Core. So when you want to pair the Common Core um, with service learning, um, this is a document. We're actually on page 17 of this document. But as you can see, what happens is they're taking real examples of um, a project and they're putting what Common Core standards um, this project is built upon and what skills are represented. I would encourage you also to break down those standards and skills into sub skills and prior knowledge that your students need to know in order to be successful. Um, but as I was going through this document, half of the examples just happen to be service learning, which is perfect, um, but it also just shows how naturally those two fit together. Um, so let's look at this example right here. It's a fourth grade sample English language, English language arts lesson. Um, so after reviewing profiles at the entrepreneurial microfinancing site such as Kiva.org, students will work in groups to research the economic and social impact of several proposals. Each group is going to select one proposal and create a presentation to persuade classmates to choose that proposal. They could also, you know, persuade the community. And the class votes on the most persuasive proposal and creates an appropriate activity plan that might or could raise money to support the chosen pro, um, proposal. And so we see 
tons of examples of people using Kiva. It's a dynamic site, dynamic program. Um, and so using this um, as a way to integrate 21st century skills as the financial literacy, um, students are critically thinking, um, especially as they're analyzing each other's um, proposals, collaborating and cr creating those proposals, information literacy, creative creativity, and global awareness. Um, the other example I want to show you straight from this site is an eighth grade sample ELA. Um, so after completing a literature circle on teen problem novels, uh, students brainstorm a list of six significant social, emotional, or health issues teens face today. So working in groups, students research one issue and create one public service announcement on a closed YouTube channel or an open YouTube channel to persuade their peers or the public about one action they should take regarding this issue. And students will select and use references from um, literary readings as well as research from nonfiction resources. And so you see the Common Core Standards, um, it's obviously based a lot in health and media um, and has have to use that technology in order to create those PSAs. Um, you're happy, happy for you to send your name to the chat box as well, or you can email it to me. So those are two examples straight from this document that uh, Marcus just sent through so that you'll have that common core toolkit that you can call upon at any point. You'll see a lot of service learning examples. Um, one of the best parts of my job is that I get to talk to a lot of amazing teachers um, about the role and what they do with service learning. Um, and the person I'm about to introduce you to right now is no exception to that rule. Um, his name is Rick Erickson. He has been teaching for 29 years, but continues to integrate new elements. Um, currently, Rick's students are partnering with the park researchers in the Apostle Islands to research contaminants and eagles. Um, and talking to Rick was really inspirational, and luckily, I was recording it all. And so I'm going to play for you a clip from um, Rick's interview with me, um, and I want you to hear straight from him. I asked him the question, what 21st century skills did your students gain um, from this project? So hold on one second while I get this to play. Boy, the list goes on. I, I was just talking to a parent because you know, the parents are just really excited about this. The, the, the kids who have done these projects
the Eagles have made a comeback. So there's a history lesson, there's writing, there's math, there's science, there's public speaking. There's, it, it's, a, it's yeah, and I'm sure I'm leaving things out. The interview that I had with Rick, um, big inspiration for me as well. Um, and so, uh, and I'll have a link later to his specific project on um, the GSN. Uh, but to give you another example, um, our member of the month for the GSN right now is uh, Chris, a fourth grade teacher from Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and his service learning project really grew organically out of, um, he has a current events weekly activity and right after the Boston bombings. So students wanted to support those runners who were not able to finish the race by walking that distance at their school, which just to let you know was over 6,000 miles. But not only did they finish that race, they also exceeded their goal and raised enough money to send a Greensboro man back next year for the marathon who was not able to finish this year. So within this project, students used Google Docs, Google Docs to organize ideas. They created partnerships with local running clubs and other classes. Um, and so please check out, um, they've been covered by the news several times. Um, there's been a lot of follow-up on their on their project, um, and he has his project all uploaded on the GSN, and he is our member of the month. This was the first time he had ever done a service learning project, so that's just incredible to see um, what can come so organically out of your youth as well. The next example I want to share um, is out of Aztec, New Mexico. Um, Lauren is a park ranger there at the Aztec Ruins National Monument, and each year um, Lauren has an appreciation dinner for volunteers at the park. But this past year, Lauren partnered with Kirtland Central High School yearbook class to create a yearbook um, for the volunteers to thank them for their, that work. And what would have normally happened is those yearbook students would get there, get to school, and they'd just spend the first two months um, doing kind of fake activities to learn design and layout um, for these programs that they need to develop. But instead, they did something and gave back to the community and created a thank you yearbook that kind of encapsulated the whole year of work that these volunteers have been doing um, and gave back. And they also gained a lot of career skills um, as different people were editors and had to manage different groups. Of um, and so there was a lot of this. And I, again, just first year of this project, they'll be doing it again next year. And then last but not least, um, I had the opportunity to meet Kurt Gills, um, also from Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, this summer at a training that we were facilitating there. Um, and I will give you an overview of this project, but I'm actually going to let um, this video speak for itself. example as well of how these students um, not only benefited um, from this project but were able to serve younger students within the district um, focused on an anti-bullying campaign learning how to use not only the music production um, techniques but also to develop and publish a book and um, this is just one of many books that they've done and Kurt is very very <laughs> proud of the work that his students have done um, and will continue to do um, as you see them there. So if you have any questions about the projects that we've gone over today, um, please send them through now. They're all available through the Generator School Network, gsn.nylc.org, um, which uh, Marcus will be sending through as well. Another um, note 
uh, is that the generator, we just published a new issue of the generator, which is our biannual newsletter. And um, it just so happens to be on 21st century learning. So if you want to hear more about some of the projects we mentioned today, as well as other projects and districts um, that have 21st century learning as a focus, um, Marcus is going to be sending through that link as well um, on how to access the, G, uh, the generator. Um, and as we begin to wind down, um, I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar, and I want to open it up to any questions that you may have still, um, as well as give you my contact information. Um, I'll stay on the line if anybody has any questions um, or if you want to chat more about what 21st century learning looks like um, through a service learning model. And I hope that we met your needs today, and please contact me if you have any other questions. So I'll stay on for a bit. Oh, and one more thank you to the partnership, one more time, Partnership for 21st Century Skills, for all that they have done and created um, that has enabled us to create this webinar today. question, will this uh, webinar be available at a later date? It will. You will all be getting um, a recording of this webinar since you signed up. Um, and we will be sending it through, the thing, uh, through our thank you email, and also it will be housed on the Generator School Network. Let's see. Question from Sarah. Is there a dialogue that we should be able to hear? I think Sarah might have just joined. Uh, Ryan asks, is there any frameworks for helping students to design service projects? Um, and so the framework that we use to help students to design is um, our iCard model. Um, we also have a service learning action plan that we have on the Generator School Network. Ryan, if you want to send me um, your contact information, I will send you a copy of the service learning action plan that can help guide students through that process. Thanks, and I'll make sure to include that link on the thank you email as well. Um, any ideas for fundraising for the sign? Kim, we have a whole topic, two different webinars, a huge discussion list on the GSN. Kim, if you send me your contact information, I'll send you that direct link of how, of the different webinars and information we have on fundraising. We have a lot on that, actually. Yep, Ryan, I'll include I'll include that in the um, I'll include the fundraising questions into um, sorry, I don't think she she sent that to all attendees, but it was a question about fundraising and we'll include that. The GSN has, yep, a whole topic on it. And also note that especially with fundraising, the majority of the grants are due at the beginning of the year. Um, but it'll really just walk you through that same process, the IPARD model, and ask you about the standards. Um, and so if you're able to kind of answer those questions to the best of your ability, most of the deadlines end up being at the beginning of fall. So it's a, it's a good thing to kind of get on now. And it looks and it like from like all the, the, um, the requests, um, maybe we should have another fundraising um, webinar um, coming up too right here in the fall. We can go over some of the um, grants um, and possibilities that are available as well. So we'll take that note down.